Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lori Fitzmaurice, and I am the Executive Director here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Today, we'll be discussing green hydrogen, what it is and the possibility of deploying green hydrogen to reduce carbon emissions and address climate change. Before we begin, let me first say quickly that this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available online in the coming days. For those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. For those of you watching the live stream anywhere else, you can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag CJEPLive and our Twitter handle at ColumbiaUEnergy. I'd like to take just a moment to introduce my panelists. Um, and again, for those watching online, my name is Laurie Fitzmaurice, and I'm here with Minister Juan Carlos Jobet, the Minister of Energy of Chile, with Dr. Julio Friedman, a senior research scholar here at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs, and with Eric Guter, Vice President and General Manager of the America's Growth Platform of Air Products and Chemicals, Inc. Thanks again for joining us. We're here to discuss green hydrogen. We'll be now um, taking some time to have the Minister of Energy of Chile, Juan Carlos Jobet, speak to us. Then we'll move on to some comments from Dr. Uh, Julio Friedman, and then Eric will speak to us. Then we'll have a moderated discussion. Uh, Mr. Minister, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you, Laurie. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Julio and Eric. It's great to share this space with you. Um, we put together a brief presentation. Well, it's not that brief. I'll, I'll try to go over it quickly uh, in, in 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, let me share the screen with you to see if this works. Uh, let's see if, if it's there. Yeah, can you see it, Lori? Yeah? OK. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to quickly go uh, over what I see are the, the main drivers for the development of, of green hydrogen. Uh, the, and the enormous momentum it has been gaining over the last um, uh, months. Uh, then talk a little bit about why Chile, we, we think, has an enormous potential in this industry, and then briefly tell you about our green hydrogen strategy. So, so I, I would say there are three main drivers that are uh, pushing the, the advance of, the, of, of green hydrogen as a very promising uh, alternative in, the, in our effort to reduce uh, uh, CO2 emissions, right? So, so the, the, the first one is uh, the, increase, the increasing number of uh, companies and, and countries that are uh, committing them, them, themselves to be carbon neutral by 2050, by 2040, some of them by 2060. Uh, so I think the awareness around climate change is, I, I would say, is the, 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 the first uh, driver. You, you know probably all of you uh, about this very well. Uh, the second one is the falling cost of renewable energies uh, and electrolysis, which are the, the, the main two drivers of uh, the cost of green hydrogen, as you know. Uh, and the third, I, it's the strategic push in national roadmaps and industry alliances. So there are many actors around the world pushing this agenda of green hydrogen. Uh, and I think these th three things are the main drivers behind what is going on in green hydrogen. Uh, first, if you look, this, these are the numbers for Chile, right? So this is a pie chart of the where are CO2 emissions coming from in our country, right? So 78% of them are coming from from the energy sector, around the third down here is electricity generation. 25% uh, of that is coal, actually. Another 24% is transport. 14% comes from industry emissions, 70% building. And the other 22, as you know, probably it's waste, uh, industrial processes, and agriculture. The numbers change from country to country, but the conclusion does not, right? And the conclusion is that if we don't transform completely our energy sectors, we will not be able to stop climate change on time, right? That is the, the simple conclusion. We committed ourselves to be carbon neutral by 2050. I don't have to get into all the details, but even though we contribute with uh, less than 0.3% of global CO2 emissions, we are gonna work to be carbon neutral by 2050 because it, that is, we think that that's the right thing to do, 
right? Uh, when we think about future generations, we have a very detailed plan to do that. Uh, uh, and if you look, I just want to highlight one number here. If you look up here, hydrogen, green hydrogen, we think will contribute with more than 20% of the required CO2 emissions reduction, right? Uh, I've seen many different international reports uh, that show that uh, hydrogen will contribute between 20 to 40, up to 45% of the reduction in CO2 emissions we, we require to be carbon neutral by 2050 as a, as a planet, right? So it's, it's very, very important. Uh, so many companies as well are, are reducing their, their exposure to CO2, right? Um, this is just a, a chart on the left that shows the proportion of global uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are already covered by carbon taxes or, or any different types of or trading systems. It's around 25%. And my guess is that, especially after what happened in the US a couple of weeks ago, this number will only go up in the following years. And I hope it goes up quickly, right? And in Chile, on, the, on your right, uh, mining, for example, which is our biggest industry, around 10% of GDP, 50% of uh, our exports, basically has a, a big carbon footprint, and they are working very aggressively to reduce that carbon footprint. They are getting out of power purchase agreements uh, that are based on coal, moving into renewable electricity. Uh, and they have a very aggressive plan to do that. So the commitment of governments and companies to reduce the carbon footprint is very, very important, right? Uh, now, the, to, for green hydrogen to play the role we all hope it to play, we really need to reduce its cost, right? So that is the main challenge, I would say. Uh, today, green hydrogen, it's still too expensive to, to replace uh, oil or natural gas, right? Um, as you know, green hydrogen, its biggest potential will probably be in areas such as long transport or heavy transport and industries that are very hard to electrify like cement or steel production, right? But so we need to reduce the cost of producing green hydrogen for it to replace fossil fuels. And we expect uh, these are numbers that we run with McKinsey and company. We expect green hydrogen to be competitive with, with, with uh, gray hydrogen produced from natural gas before the end of this decade. Under different assumptions, that can be as early as 2027, we believe, right? Um, we have already countries around the world with uh, the uh, they, they have more than 70% of global GDP. They already have strategies to boost the development of green hydrogen. I'm going to go quickly over these. And if you look at the, these are numbers from McKinsey again. If you look by uh, at 2050, they expect the, the, the energy demand supplied by green hydrogen to basically explode, especially in areas where that, that are today generating a lot of CO2. Right? So if you look at the numbers on your right and, and pay attention to these numbers. So they estimate that by 2050, almost 20%, uh, 18%, they believe, of final energy demand globally will be supplied by green hydrogen, right? So that's huge. They estimate that the market by 2050 of green hydrogen will be $2.5 trillion per year. That is. To give you a sense, that is around 50%, so half the current size of the oil market globally. So it's enormous, right? Goldman Sachs recently, recently published their own report with numbers that are even more aggressive on, on what will happen with green hydrogen, right? So that is the, the kind of the global picture. Now, why Chile? So basically, very quickly, Chile, we have, we have been, uh, we have very developed, uh, uh, electricity generation um, market industry with very stable rules. Uh, Bloomberg uh, recently ranked our country as number two globally to develop uh, clean energies investments. Uh, but we have historically depended on imported fossil fuels as sources of energy, and we are replacing those with renewable energies very quickly. Um, so this is a map of our country. Different colors basically represent different Technolo different technologies or resources, right? So the, the message here is that we have basically no fossil fuels, but we have the best solar irradiance on the planet, especially in the north, 
up here on your left. Uh, we have hydropower in the central part of a country. And we have in many places around the country or along the country, but especially in the south in Patagonia, very, very strong winds. Uh, capacity factors for those of you who are familiar with the, those concepts, capacity factors for uh, uh, wind generation in Patagonia can be up to uh, even higher than 60% onshore, right? Which is which is very very attractive, right? So, and in terms of and the, and the sheer uh, uh, quantity of resources is enormous. We we could develop profitably renewable energy resources that are 70 times the size of our current installed capacity, right? So we need to find ways to develop these uh, resources to use to use clean electricity at home, but also to export that to the world. And green hydrogen looks as the best way to do that. Um, this is our electricity generation matrix. Historically, we have depended on hydro, uh, coal, natural gas. Last year, we, we produced almost 40% of our electricity from coal. But if you look into the future, we're going to phase out coal completely by 2040. We're going to develop very aggressively solar and wind also uh, CSP, and we expect our renewable matrix to be 70% renewable by 2030 and almost 100% renewable by 2050. Just to give you a sense of how quickly this is moving, five years ago when we ran these numbers, we thought we were going to be 70% renewable by 2050. So five years later, we uh, updated those numbers and we're going to reach that goal two decades before. Right, so this opens up many opportunities. So we need to phase out coal. As I said, uh, we have a very clear plan with a very specific timetable. Uh, we're gonna close those plants, making sure we we take care of uh, uh, potential uh, negative effects on unemployment on local communities and so on. Um, and if you look at the at the at the world map and you say, okay. Where, is, where are the places where green hydrogen can be produced based on those renewable resources? Uh, more competitively, and these again are numbers from McKinsey and company, there is only one country they estimate that by 2030 we'll be able to produce green hydrogen at less than $1.5 per kilogram, and that is Chile down here in South America, as you know, right? Uh, there are many other countries that can be very competitive between $1.5 and $2 per kilogram, but only Chile below 1.5, right? Um, so, so based on, the, on those resources and to be able to take advantage of this enormous opportunity, we uh, run our own numbers in, in a lot of detail. And uh, based on that analysis, we unveiled a couple of weeks ago our green hydrogen strategy. Uh, this get into more details for the cost of production, right? As you see on the left, uh, independence, independent on if you produce it in the north with sun, solar uh, PV or in the south with wind, we will reach between 1.3 and $1.4 per kilogram by 2030, right? Uh, these again are, are numbers uh, by McKinsey and company. Uh, so Chile between 1.3 and 1.4, Australia around 1.7 and so on, right? So we're gonna be very competitive by the end of the decade. Um, and then some people ask me, okay, that's fine, but you're pretty far away from the US, Europe, Asia, right? So we run more detailed numbers. And to give you just uh, the main message here, our cost of production is so low that we more um, that it more than compensates the relative disadvantage because we are, uh, we are a distant country, right? So we can be even cheaper, uh, the selling to Korea, Japan, uh, compared with Australia, even though we are, we, are, we are more far away. And the other thing that is attractive from our geography is that since our country is very narrow, you're always pretty close to the coast. So you, if you compare Chile with other countries that have good resources, but that have those resources like six or 700 kilometers inland, we, we have an advantage in terms of the amount of money you got to invest on transmission lines, pipelines, and so on. Uh, and the other thing that is attractive is that we can export uh, through the Pacific to the, to the west coast of the US or to, or to Asia. And also from Patagonia, we already have a project there to export from Patagonia through the Atlantic to Europe, right? Uh, we can talk about this later in the panel, but there are 
different uh, ways being developed to transport green hydrogen itself or green ammonia or synthetic fuels and so on. Um, so our strategy uh, set very ambitious, ambitious goals. We, we want to work to be the cheapest green hydrogen producer on the planet before 2030. We're gonna, uh, we want to be one of the top three exporters of green hydrogen and its derivatives uh, before 2030 as well. And we have many other goals. We thought it was very important to have very specific and clear targets to be reached at specific point, points in, in time so, so people can, can keep an eye on how we're, how we're making progress. Uh, and our action plan is very complete, very exhaustive. I don't want to get into all the details, but we need to promote our domestic market and then the export market. We are defining the standards, safety, and, and we're uh, helping private companies developing uh, their projects. By the way, we have more than 20 companies or, co or consortiums of companies that already developing green hydrogen projects in Chile. We're taking, we're, we, we've got to make sure that this industry creates social uh, value at, at the local level. Uh, and we are also working to make sure that the development of this industry creates capabilities and innovation, research, and so on that uh, allows us to play the, the leading role we want to, to play. So I'm going to leave it there. I think. I think this is where the presentation ends. I don't want to get more time, so we can leave some time for the uh, for the debate. So thank you so much, and I'll talk to you in a minute. Excellent. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, I know there are some questions we have here. I'm going to hold off until we get to the moderated panel, and we're going to turn to Dr. Julio Friedman for his comments. Julio? Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Minister, for joining us. Es un placer compartir, uh, compartirles esta presentación. Um, it's a pleasure to share this presentation with you today. Uh, this is the seven minute version of the seven hour lecture. So uh, I will try to keep it brief and look forward to talking about details of this uh, in the actual Q and A to come. Uh, I really wanted to go with the theme of the discussion today, demystifying green hydrogen. Um, there's an awful lot of information and hype out there, and in part because this is exciting. There's a lot going on, not just in Chile, but in Japan, in Saudi Arabia, in the EU, uh, in industry. Uh, and in fact, it's a major trend. Uh, most recently, uh, China's Sinopec said that they were going to go big on hydrogen, but it's hard to separate hype uh, and try to figure out where there's opportunity and where there's good things to do. So with that, I wanted to give everyone here just a little bit of fact and information. Part of the reason, as uh, uh, the Minister uh, Jobet said, is that uh, hydrogen is the Swiss army knife of deep decarbonization. It works in all sectors. Uh, my favorite is in heavy industry. Today, most of the hydrogen in the world is used there, 70 million tons a year. Uh, we can replace that emission set, uh, that hydrogen production today emits almost half a billion ton of CO2 every year. If we just replace that with green hydrogen, that'd be a win. Uh, we can also use it to replace heat for things like cement and iron and steel and chemicals. I'll come back to that in my discussion. High temperature, low carbon heat is hard to get and hydrogen provides that. It is a good transportation fuel, either directly used, just in things like heavy duty trucking or in operating a port, but you can also make synthetic fuels from it I'll talk a little bit about ammonia, but you can make synthetic jet fuel or methanol uh, from the hydrogen and use that to decarbonize hard to decarbonize parts of the economy. Uh, it is also an option in the power sector. You can generate hydrogen with electrolysis. You can take that hydrogen and run it back through a fuel cell and generate electricity. Uh, and in places where there's congestion or curtailment, this looks interesting. And of course, you can use it to do things like make plastics, provide heat in residential areas, and even uh, remove CO2 in the process with things like biohydrogen, or use that hydrogen to power a CO2 removal system. So there's a lot that you can do with this hydrogen, and this can accelerate and enable a clean energy transition and the just transition. Uh, when you burn hydrogen, there's no carbon emissions. There may be upstream carbon emissions, but when you burn it or use it, there aren't. Um, and it burns hot, 2,100 degrees Celsius. That's enough heat for anybody. Um, 
if you have low carbon inputs, the hydrogen itself can have a very low carbon footprint. Generally, people talk about this in two flavors, green hydrogen, which is today's subject, in which you make it with electrolysis of zero carbon energy. Uh, this picture uh, was just a short time ago, the largest facility in the world in Norway. Um, you can also make it from fossil fuels, either through gasification or reformation of natural gas and capture all the CO2 that comes from that process that is often referred to as blue hydrogen. Today, we're just gonna be talking about green hydrogen and in the context of Chile. The way that hydrogen is made, as I said today, is usually from some reformation of a fossil fuel. Today, that CO2 is just vented to the atmosphere. But in fact, you can capture and store that CO2 if you want. In order for green hydrogen to have a low carbon footprint, it must have zero carbon electricity inputs. As the minister said, this could come from hydro or solar or wind or a mix of these. It could also come from geothermal. It could also come from nuclear. Zero carbon electricity goes in, hydrogen and oxygen come out. The key challenges with this functionally are cost. There's other challenges, but I'm gonna talk about cost first. Today, uh, most places in the world, green hydrogen costs a lot more than blue or gray hydrogen. By a lot more in Europe, it costs a factor of two more. In the United States, it costs a factor of four more. In other economies, even more than that. And that is just the, the, the punchline. Most of that cost is the cost of electricity. Today, electrolyzers represent about 30% of those costs. That means that if the electrolyzer costs drop by 50%, you only have about a 15% drop in the hydrogen costs. 50% electricity drop cost is, I mean, if electrolyzer cost is 15% cost in the hydrogen. 55% is the cost of electricity. Um, and in that context, I want to draw your attention to the little chart at the bottom. A number that people like to kick around in this is when do you hit $2 hydrogen? And as the minister said, Chile is looking for one and a half dollar hydrogen. I sincerely hope you get there. But to get $2 hydrogen, if your electrolyzer costs $1,000 a kilowatt, you need three cent per kilowatt hour electricity all the time, high capacity factors. Alternatively, if you're just going to have a 20% capacity factor, like from curtailment, or solar power working 20% of the time, you need a half cent per kilowatt hour. It has to be really, really, really cheap to hit that. So as you'll see in the rest of my presentation to come, the focus is where can you get a lot of cheap green electricity? If you can do that, you can make competitive green hydrogen. There are other issues though I wanna mention briefly. One of them is on manufacturing. Today, electrolyzers are made by people in shops. We do not have mass manufacturing of these things. China, Germany, Korea, Norway, Japan, hopefully the United States are all chasing this bogey. We would love to have low cost electrolyzer manufacturing. Today, we're not quite there yet. It also means the speed at which we can scale up is limited because there's artisans banging these things out with a hammer and tongs and closing the seals with a wrench. Until we get to this point where we can mass manufacture these things, it will limit the speed we can move. The other is an infrastructure limit. Even for green hydrogen, you need a lot of transmission capacity. You need a lot of transmission capacity. Uh, the International Energy Agency has estimated something like a future demand of 500 million tons a year, megatons per annum. Uh, that requires doubling the entire transmission of the world. Double the generation of electricity, double the transmission of electricity. So you mean you have infrastructure limits that we're coming to face, and again, which I'm sure Minister Jobet is already considering. I wanted to take a moment and talk about the scale of these things. Today, we can make blue hydrogen at large scale in many places of the world, and in fact, that's going on. With green hydrogen, we're not quite there yet. The one place where we are gonna be doing this soon, for sure, is in Saudi Arabia at the NEOM project, which is an air products project. I don't wanna steal Eric Guter's thunder. I'll let him talk more about that and other things. But until we, but that will be the first really large scale plant making on the order of five or 600 tons a day of hydrogen. 
Until we get a lot more of those things, it'll be hard to achieve our climate goals. That's why Chile is so interesting and exciting. There's a case study that I want to mention because it's been getting some airtime lately. This is on something called the Asian Renewable Energy Hub. Like Chile, they have a favorable alignment of renewable resources, and they are going to be making uh, green ammonia for sale in Japan, Singapore, and Korea. That ammonia will be made with green hydrogen. Uh, in this context, this will be a very, very big plant on the order of 26 gigawatts of electricity that will make about 10 million tons of ammonia a year. It has a very large footprint. Here it is in Australia. That's what it looks like up close. And it'll take another eight years to build this thing, moving at all speeds. Um, this already uses something like electrolyzers that, that are priced at six or $700 a kilowatt. So we're starting to see those $1,000 costs come down, but we're not at $500 or less today. The total cost of this project will be $40 billion. That's a lot of money. It'll make a lot of hydrogen, but that 10 million tons of hydrogen that it makes is something like 1 80th of what's necessary to decarbonize iron and steel, 1 20th of what's necessary to decarbonize shipping. There's lots of room to grow in all of these markets. Last but not least, Chile is well positioned to produce this green hydrogen for the reasons that the minister said. Uh, his map is in many ways better than mine. I refer you to his, but this shows you where just the wind and the solar are. And the reason I talk about wind and solar is you need that high capacity factor. You need something like 70 or 80% operation of these things because otherwise you're not making your money back on your electrolyzer. Uh, Chile also has deep water ports in the Pacific, a good industrial ecosystem uh, and other benefits that they can draw on, for example, a skilled workforce. Uh, we are seeing rapid growth in these markets. I'm sure we'll talk about that more during the Q&A, but I just wanted to tee up this discussion with you. As I said before, where you can find high capacity factors and cheap electricity, that's a place where you should be excited about green hydrogen. In that context, I work at a policy shop. We think about what policies would help enable rapid investment and deployment, not just in the US, but around the world not just in individual countries, but across nations. And we hope to have some time to talk about that uh, during the Q&A. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I would love to have talked more, but you're gonna learn more listening to the other speakers and their comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, we're going to move on to Eric's comments, and then we will have a, a moderated discussion and then get to the many really interesting questions in the Q&A. So Eric. Hi, good day, everyone. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, fellow panelists. It's a pleasure uh, meeting with you today. My name is Eric Guter. I'm Air Products Vice President and General Manager of our America's Growth Platforms, encompassing carbon capture and storage and hydrogen for mobility, uh, where this is an integral uh, component of, this, of what we're talking about today. Just a brief background on Air Products. It's the uh, only US-based industrial gas company. Uh, it's been in business for 80 years. Uh, we're about $9 billion in sales and have operations in over 50 countries around the globe. We uh, also execute a number of uh, hydrogen fuelings around the world, about a million and a half per year, and have been involved in all forms of hydrogen and hydrogen for mobility. In addition to that, as Julio mentioned, we're also investing right now uh, over $7 billion to accelerate the transition to zero carbon transportation. Uh, as my fellow panelists have uh, highlighted, it takes uh, several key elements to come together for hydrogen uh, to be made economically and to uh, in order for the to facilitate the transition to zero emissions in production and zero emission vehicles. <clears throat> that those factors include world class renewable power resources such as exist in Chile. Uh, in addition to that, it takes a significant uh, reduction in the capital costs. We believe that can only be accomplished by world scale investment like we're undertaking in uh, Saudi Arabia as part of our NEOM project. <clears throat> uh, 
And so we're very excited about the prospect of uh, bringing this project to life and bringing more projects to life like are contemplated in uh, Chile that we're talking about today. And just to highlight what we're doing in Saudi Arabia, which is uh, very germane to what we're talking about today here is taking renewable power from solar and wind, uh, converting, using that renewable power to convert uh, water via electrolysis to hydrogen. And in the case of our project and others contemplate different uh, ways of doing this, but we will take that hydrogen to ammonia. Ammonia is commonly transported around the world for major industrial and agricultural markets today. Move that, hydro that ammonia wherever it's needed and transform it back into hydrogen uh, for the uh, transportation market wherever that's desired. There are many geographies around the globe that are actively participating in mandates and incentives to rapidly accelerate the transition to zero emissions uh, hydrogen and zero emissions vehicles, uh, and as well as in the industrial power sector. Uh, we're very excited about the, the efforts that Chile is undertaking, where we have a major presence as the largest industrial gas company in uh, South America under the name Endura, and uh, very excited to get to your questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Eric. Really appreciate that. And we have many really interesting questions from the audience. Before we get to those, um, I admit I have a few of my own <laughs> that uh, I have been, been thinking about since we started discussing this panel. And uh, Minister, I'd, I'd like to start, if you don't mind, I know that you have to move on to um, another commitment. So we would like to just ask you a couple of questions if you could, and then we'll take a couple of questions from the, the audience before you do move on to your other event. Um, my minister, uh, thank you for your, your detailed presentation. It was extremely helpful. As you think about um, Chile's competitive position, and, and clearly um, I know that you and, and your government and your ministry in particular have been through an exhaustive multi-stakeholder process to think through and develop your strategy. But as you think about Chile's competitive position relative to other potential sources um, courting uh, potential markets, how do you believe Chile can differentiate itself um, from its competitors? Great. Thank you, Laurie. I think, I think the, the first thing is, uh, is the quality of our natural resources. I think, as, as Julio said, I mean, the cost of electricity is essential and, and, can, and will differ from country to country. As the cost of electrolyzers go down, that will go down everywhere at the same time, right, basically. Uh, so the cost of producing electricity, it's essential. And we have the best solar irradiance on the planet in the north, and, our, and the winds are very, very strong and very persistent, especially in the south. So I think that is the, the first thing. The second thing we, we think it's important is, as I said during the presentation, is our geography, right? To, be, to, to have good resources to produce renewable electricity. Uh, and for those resources to be close to the ports, it's also very important because it reduces the required investment in infrastructure, right? Which is which can also be very, very important in the total cost of production. Uh, and we also have um, a very stable uh, regulatory regime and a very competitive uh, electric uh, industry, right? So we have already here in Chile presence of uh, several dozens of companies from all over the world already developing projects uh, to produce renewable electricity. So that capacity is in place. So I think, and also, as I said, I mean, our location will allow us to export through the Pacific or through the Atlantic to different destinations. And maybe another thing that is important is we have free trade agreements with almost 90% uh, of the world's GDP. To be precise, it's 86% of the world's GDP. So if you want to invest in Chile to export to the, to the, to the world, we have, you have a very uh, open market right there. Uh, but but uh, I think that is the, the combination of, of things that, are, that I, we think are unique. 
do you expect um, water constraints to be a limiting factor for electrolyzers in, in the north, for example? No, 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 we don't, to be honest with you. Just uh, something that I think maybe who you already can compliment. Hydrogen is not very intensive in terms of the water it requires. Let me give you an example. We, we have a very big mining industry, as I said in the presentation. Uh, our estimates show that our mining companies, all of the mining industry in Chile, could replace 100% of the diesel they burn with their trucks. One mining truck can burn like 2,000 liters of diesel per day, so it's a lot of diesel. They could replace 100% of that diesel with green hydrogen, producing that hydrogen with less than 1%, less than 1% of the water the mining industry already consumes. Right, so it's not very intensive in water, right? You gotta explain these to local communities. I mean, water, as climate change, I mean, gets worse. I mean, it will be increasingly difficult to find, right? But, but we think that it's not gonna be uh, a main constraint, uh, uh, the, the availability of water. Excellent. I would agree with that just quickly. Um, you do need high quality water like the like it needs to be very very pure water to avoid corroding the electrolyzers but the cost and the availability of water to date has not proven a problem anywhere and we don't expect it to be there's just not that much consumption involved great thank you julio um and i'm going to take a question um from the q a for the minister because i know that you're going to have to to leave us before um all right. yeah, I, can, I can stay up, up to 5 uh, p.m. local time. So we have still have 20 minutes. So you, okay. if you want to just Perfect. open the discussion, don't, don't, don't rush. Oh, excellent. Then, then I'll continue with, with the moderated discussion then. Um, Julio, one of the things that, that you and I have often talked about and you, you often say is when it comes to hydrogen, we know what it is. We know how to make it. Um, I'd like to ask you, what is it that we don't know? When you, when you think about it, where do you wanna focus the attention of your research initiative the most? Where do you think we need to put our energies? So there's really two overarching things that I think we need to understand. What is how much can we really drop the cost of production? Uh, these Bloomberg numbers and these McKinsey numbers are, are helpful, but they don't really talk about the material or thermodynamic limits of these things. And, and there should be a deep innovation agenda on this. Uh, some people think that because these are relatively mature technologies, there's not more improvement to get. I just strongly disagree. Um, there, and, and we don't really have a clear understanding of what the limits of those things are. In that same case, uh, it is also true about the use cases for hydrogen. Uh, how do we make better fuel cells? How do we make better synthetic fuels that use hydrogen? Uh, if the point of hydrogen is decarbonization, then we need to figure out how to put it into more parts of the economy. How do you really put zero carbon hydrogen or zero carbon ammonia into a steel mill? Or do you need to replace it with a DRI plant? Uh, uh, these sorts of applications and questions are, there's a huge research agenda around this that is really important to understand. Uh, but the other one is really, how do we get this stuff to market? Um, and the part of that is an infrastructure question, which like I and the minister had mentioned, things like ports and transmission lines, CO2 storage sites for blue hydrogen is an option. But, but the other part of it is how do we really get the stuff to market? What are the most important market aligning policies? And uh, here, you know, again, there's an endless set of options to set, but, but right now we're kind of fumbling in the dark on these things. We don't know if an investment tax credit or a feed-in tariff or a contract for differences uh, is the right way to go or for that matter, if a border tariff is the right way to go, or if government should just start buying green hydrogen, or if government should start building infrastructure. Like we don't have a sense of what the trade-offs between these things are and the costs and their effectiveness. So we actually need to do some more scholarship on what's the right way to get this stuff to market. Eric, perhaps you could weigh in here. From, from your perspective, from the private sector, what are the two to three most relevant items that you would be looking for in terms of market development? If you were 
to sit down and dialogue um, with a government representative, for example, if you were talking to, to the minister, what would you suggest that he consider in the development of a policy? Oh, no, thank you for that question. I, I think that um, what can be helpful is um, for private industry to be able to invest uh, assurance that policy supporting the adoption of green hydrogen will be there, will be there for the long term. And so uh, with that, uh, that gets at the production of green hydrogen. I think you also have to have the end user demand there. And so uh, policy that supports uh, a conversion and a rapid conversion uh, to uh, fuel cell electric vehicles, as an example, also helps drive the private sector investment. I think with the assurity that regulatory framework is there and will be there uh, for a long period of time helps the private sector make investments both in the hydrogen production and in the vehicles that are required to decarbonize the transportation sector. Additionally, this can be extended into other sectors like the industrial sector, power sector, et cetera, um, to support that uh, rapid transition. Excellent, thank you. I, th I was just gonna add, uh, I think another important point to add to all this is that to make sure that uh, we have uh, appropriate uh, standards uh, in place as well with that. So safety standards in terms of how we're handling it, um, that there's a, um, and also the usage so that it's standardized across the industry. As I, as I look through the questions, we're getting a lot of interesting questions um, in reference on the cost side to um, minister some of the comments you made about Chile's goal to be the lowest cost producer. And a lot of people are asking about, there may be a lot of um, emphasis placed on the low cost of production, but what about the economics of transoceanic um, transportation? And, and is there any hydrogen being exported or being transported overseas today? Um. That, that is a great question. It's a great question because I, I don't know if Eric and Julio will agree with me, but I think there, there is still uncertainty on how quickly we will, we will be able to reduce globally, I mean, the cost of electrolyzers. But I think there's even more uncertainty on how, how quickly we will be able to reduce the cost of transporting green hydrogen itself, right? I mean, the, the market for, the, for transporting ammonia is pretty well developed, right? But if, but if the end user wants to use hydrogen, the cost of transforming hydrogen to ammonia, then exporting ammonia, then coming back to hydrogen is very, very expensive, right? It's not very efficient. So the, one of the challenges is to develop more quickly the market for moving around uh, green hydrogen itself. I mean, you can you can liquefy it as you do with natural gas, but the temperature has to be even lower, so it's harder to do it. Um, I think Japan already uh, built and it's operating a ship that's moving <laughs> green hydrogen liquefied around, but it's there's still uncertainty on that front. So our strategy basically. Uh, it's built on waves. So we're gonna tackle the local market first, right? Uh, and then we're gonna move to the export market, but first exporting ammonia, green ammonia. Uh, and exporting green hydrogen itself, it's, it's I mean, more than a decade uh, down the road because we think that, that it's st there's still uncertainty there. So when we, when we say we're gonna be the cheapest producer of green hydrogen, we're talking about green hydrogen, but it's derivatives as, as well, right? And maybe you know, let me make one point that I think was uh, uh, just connecting a couple of the things that were said earlier, which I think maybe it's obvious, but we have a chicken or egg problem here, right? Because the main challenge here is to reduce the cost of production, but to do that, we need to scale up projects. And to scale up projects, we need demand, big demand with long-term contracts at a defined price. But you will not get that, those contracts if you're unable to reduce the cost. So you get kind of a chicken or egg problem. So the role of governments, we think, is to help, as Julio said, to help with some public support to make sure that we can reduce that cost for off takers to sign a contract to then scale up production and reduce costs, right? So we gotta set the ball rolling. And I think that is one of the policy challenges we're dealing with at the moment. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, one of the, the the number of questions have come across on that demand side that you just mentioned. And so I'd, I'd like to toss this question out, out to the panel on the demand side, what investments would need to occur um, it, for consumers as thinking about heavy industry and transportation, for example, in, in order to adapt, would there need to be for a, a fuel switch, for example? Um, Julio, can you comment on that? Sure, uh, I'm gonna uh, rely on Eric heavily to talk about the markets and, and sort of where they're going. Um, but we have now seen Japan lay out a 2050 net zero mandate, China with 2060. Uh, we see Singapore with compelling 2040 and 2050 net zero targets. The market is starting to emerge. And today Japan is absolutely paying more money for low carbon ammonia. Um, they are pursuing an interesting strategy here, and I want to talk about this both from the prior question and also Minister uh, Jobet's points. Uh, there, to make hydrogen cost a certain amount, to then liquefy it, ship it, and regasify it on the other side costs almost the same amount. It's a lot of money, <laughs> okay? And so um, the uh, part of the reason people are going to ammonia is that it is much easier to convert and much cheaper to convert that hydrogen to ammonia and then ship that, okay? So one of the questions is not only how can you use the hydrogen, but how can you use green ammonia? And Japan is again pioneering this. They're creating their own use cases. They're putting ammonia straight into natural gas turbines and running the gas turbine on vapor phase ammonia. They are blending it in with coal plants. They're currently at about 50% mixed fuels, 50% coal, 50% ammonia. And JERA, J-E-R-A, the Japanese uh, power company, has just said they're going to start working towards 100% substitution for ultra supercritical coal plants. So you can take that fuel without the energy losses and without the additional capital cost of regasifying and so forth and just throwing it straight into applications. Uh, you might want to put hydrogen into a truck, but you might actually choose to run the truck on an ammonia fuel cell if your market sort of starts going that way. The thing that is interesting is that each market is gonna have a different demand and a different use case and may choose a slightly different technology pathway. And so this stepped approach that the minister is talking about where you go after the local market first, there's one export market today, and then you see where things emerge, I, I think is a pretty smart and savvy strategy. Eric, I'd, as you listen to us comment on these and th things and think about it from the perspective of air products strategy, and you look at the globe and the different markets emerging, how do you prioritize these different emerging markets? We certainly look at uh, markets that uh, are, you know, have a policy underpinning the adoption or uh, of either fuel cell vehicles or you know, getting to zero carbon. I, I live in California, so as an example, in California, there's a tremendous amount of policy <clears throat> that is uh, driving decarbonization in the transportation market. Uh, recently, Governor Newsom announced the, uh, the ban of combustion engines in the light duty market by 2035, in the heavy duty market by 2045. Uh, that's in addition to other uh, several other policies that are supporting uh, the conversion to zero emission vehicles and zero emission power in the state. So uh, when you have that type of regulatory policy underpinning um, OEMs and uh, industrial producers making turbines and cars and buses and trucks that will be zero emissions, that gives folks like your products the confidence that the demand will be there and therefore the confidence to build uh, these step out projects like we've announced uh, to ultimately work very hard and very quickly at driving down the price of hydrogen uh, to a, you know, hopefully in the near future, an equivalent price to transportation fuels today. Great, thank you. Laurie, yeah. just very briefly, I think there are a couple of, of industries where we can start using green hydrogen without any transformation of the, of the operation of, of those industries. One is oil refineries, right? They use hydrogen. Today, that's gray hydrogen. They can switch from gray to green with no alterations in, in, their, in, in their processes, right? So that's one that's very obvious. And the second one is uh, natural gas pipelines, right? I mean, 
most people agree that up to 20%, you can just uh, blend uh, hydrogen with natural gas that, can, that it's used at, 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 at the residential clients and industrial clients uh, with no changes in the infrastructure, right? So, so those are the, the natural first steps to, to start scaling up the industry, we think. I would modify that only slightly, Minister. Uh, Chile is blessed with recent infrastructure. So 20% works very well for you and in other places with recent infrastructure. Uh, in California, we are currently at a blending in about 4% and trying to get to higher parts in Los Angeles, maybe 5%, maybe 10%. But in many parts of the United States, it would probably not be safe to go to such high fractions beyond 10%. Um, one of the things that I think is important from a policy discussion is actually just figuring that out. Have states and governments go figure out how much of this stuff they can do. Because right now we don't have answers to that stuff and you need to get some scientists and engineers answering that question for real. Yeah, that's true. We're actually hiring consultants to, to get that number right, right? So just for people, I mean, Julio can correct me if I'm wrong, but the molecule of hydrogen, it's smaller than the molecule of natural gas. So the risk of a leakage from the pipeline is higher with, with, uh, with hydrogen, among other reasons, right? So, but we can True. use it, yeah. But it is also the case that we have a really good safety record with hydrogen, and Eric talked about that a moment ago. Yep, uh, we, we operate uh, uh, several hundred, uh, up to a thousand miles of hydrogen pipeline without serious uh, accident or incident. Uh, it just has to be very well managed and, uh, uh, you know, companies like ours design and over design to uh, ensure that there are no incidents uh, that would occur as we move to uh, hydrogen pipeline networks. And Eric, I think that's a really important point. We've received a number of questions in the Q&A asking, is hydrogen safe for transportation, considering that its thermal power, power triples that of gasoline or diesel? If you could expand on that a little bit more, I think it's that people who are not in the specific industry that you're in are simply not as familiar with it. Yeah, so uh, hydrogen has been used for a long time, not on a major scale for uh, transportation uh, and the like. Certainly it takes, uh, you know, we've been doing this for about 80 years or uh, almost our entire company history, but with that comes a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge and experience to manage the safety aspects of this. We were uh, about 30 years pioneered uh, the safety standards and the fueling standards associated with light duty vehicles. Uh, it takes an eye towards that uh, to make sure that it's done, it's done safely, done properly. If it's handled uh, uh, properly, it can be managed safely. But it, you know, it is a fuel, like all fuels, there is a hazard with it when it's not managed properly. And so it is important that we have uh, unified safety standards and codes uh, mm -hmm. to in ensure that, uh, that this can be done safely. Great. Just, just quickly on that, you know, again, we make 70 million tons of this stuff today, right? <laughs> we move it around. Like, it's not like we don't have any experience with this quite a lot. And in fact, in the United States, OSHA has extremely stringent, well-enforced requirements. Uh, the Department of Transportation, same thing for pipelines. Like, there's a lot of regulation on this. Uh, in my, one of my prior jobs at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, we would make hydrogen tanks for cars and we would drop them out of helicopters and we would shoot guns at them and we would throw them in furnaces. Like we know that we can do the job. Um, and so really the, the question is uh, if there's any place it's actually where hydrogen for transportation is less safe, it's actually around the fueling station itself, which is why companies like Air Products have dedicated fueling stations that have a very special safety protocol to do the job right. Like you don't wanna to go to Joe's hydrogen and grill. You wanna to go to an actual, actual fueling station that knows how to do this. Thank you for pointing that out. If I ever see Joe's hydrogen fuel station and grill, I'll just keep driving on by. <laughs> Actually, you've hit on a really important point, I think, which is that, you know, these are things that people don't generally know about, which is why I feel like in these occasions where we have the opportunity to talk about it, it's really important for us to communicate that. Um, you know, and one of the things that as we have more of these webinars and we talk about hydrogen, I think the more we can emphasize that this, there is an industrial use for this already, and we can get that kind of information out. I think it's it's really important. Um, Minister Jobet, one thing I want to um, share with you before you go is give you an opportunity to answer um, a couple of the questions that we've received on the, the issue of um, the uh, really unprecedented opportunity that green hydrogen represents for Chile. And we've received a few questions about um, 
how the Chilean government can work to make sure that the economic development benefits um, will be shared equitably across the country. Um, so if you could comment on that, uh, we've received three separate questions on that specific. Yes, I can. I, I will answer that in a, in a, in a second. Um, I want to come back to something we mentioned, which I think it's important also for people to get a sense of, of, of the potential, is synthetic fuels. Because we didn't mention them, I think they are important. You can basically produce, we have a project in the south of Chile, for example, in Patagonia, that would produce synthetic fuel. And that basically you take electricity, in that case, produced with wind, you produce green hydrogen, and then you take CO2 from the atmosphere, and you basically, you, how do you say that? Look, you synthesize it with, with the hydrogen and you get a synthetic fuel that can replace gasoline, right? So you can use it in internal combustion vehicles without many changes, I, I would say, in the engines. Uh, and it's, uh, again, a zero emissions fuel. I mean, it emits CO2 when it's, when it's burned, but since you got that CO2 at the beginning of the process to produce it, its net effect is zero, right? So you can still use internal combustion engines uh, to, 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 to basically be fueled with green hydrogen. So one of the, coming back to your question, I think for, that is very important for us. Chile is a very, given our geography, still a very uh, centralized country, right? So a lot of people live in Santiago, in the center of the country. We have a lot of economic activity in the country. Uh, but the natural resources to produce clean electricity are uh, spread throughout the country. So that's great, because we will be able to bring investment, to create employment, to develop infrastructure in all those different places in the country that historically have not received a lot of investment. So that will, that will happen naturally, right? The, I think the, the biggest challenge is how do we make sure that we are able to basically have the, uh, the human resources in place, we're, we're able to train people locally, that we build that capacity in local universities, right? Uh, so I think that is an essential part of our strategy. Uh, and we're working with local stakeholders in all those communities and all those regions to be able to build that uh, basically strategy and to put it in place together. If I could just follow very briefly, Minister, on two things you'd mentioned. One of them is on synthetic fuels. I, I did mention it very quickly in passing. There is already a place that takes CO2 out of the air and turns it into natural gas. There's a project in Italy. The company is called Climeworks. They've worked with a company called Sunfire and they're doing that. There's a completely different company called Carbon Engineering that plans to make jet fuel this way that plans to pull CO2 out of the air, use green hydrogen and make jet fuel. And, and the fact that, that these things already exist at a small scale, uh, I think is uh, true to your vision of where this can go. The other thing I wanted to say briefly is, boy, we need really low cost electrolyzers. We need really cheap green electricity, but we sure need a whole lot more people who understand this stuff. The human cap capital is actually the most limited component of this. And I'm not just talking about scientists and engineers. I mean, workers, laborers, uh, regulators, contractors, lawyers, like this is a team sport, everybody. We need to get a lot of people into this arena in order to scale this. Because if we don't have human beings getting the job done, the job won't get done. And Julio, you just answered one of the questions in the, in the chat group, you anticipated it. <laughs> it was about uh, synthetic jet fuel. So thank you for doing that. Minister, I do believe that you need to um, move to another event. So I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you um, on behalf of the Center on Global Energy Policy for your participation. And we look forward to doing this again virtually, but hopefully in person. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I really encourage everyone who's watching to to learn more, to get involved. I mean, this, this can be very big and you can have a lot of impact. So thank you so much for the invitation. I hope we can stay in touch. We look bye forward to you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, and uh, we I have 
a number of other things to discuss. Julio and Eric, we've got a lot of really interesting questions, so I will jump right in. I'm going to start with one that I'd like to ask both of you, which is, um, and I'm going to use to frame the rest of our discussion. This is not the first time the global community has been discussing hydrogen. Um, it has had sort of false starts in the past. What makes this time different? Eric? Great question. Sure, I, I'll I'll go first and interested to hear Julio's thoughts on this. I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes it takes a little bit of trial and error uh, to get this right. I think what we see now is just a broad uh, coalition of committed uh, geographies and now uh, private companies that are committed to getting to net zero um, because they see the dangers and impacts associated with climate change. And so I think it's taken, uh, you know, uh, uh, several years, uh, probably a better part of a decade for uh, the collective uh, understanding of this to advance to a point where now uh, it is, you know, it is real, it is happening. Uh, there's so much energy uh, moving behind this already in the U.S. We've seen the announcement of two to three uh, refineries uh, permanently shutting down, the conversion of several to uh, renewable diesel facilities. Um, and a number, you know, more hydrogen projects than I can uh, point to in and of a day. I can't believe how much momentum is being generated now in this industry. And I think for the first time, it has the uh, staying power that it's lacked in the past. In addition to that, I would just say that the, uh, you know, the OEMs are rapidly uh, advancing their technology, which, you know, these things go hand in hand. And uh, absent that, you know, we wouldn't be able to have uh, in the outlet for green hydrogen that's needed. So. It is a collective good moving towards us the same goal, and I think it has finally gotten to the point that it needs to. So uh, let me just quickly add to that: like uh, the same thing has happened with solar in the past. The same thing has happened with electric cars in the past. Everybody's, you know, it, it fails until it doesn't. It fails until it succeeds, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and so the, the idea that it can succeed is shouldn't surprise anybody. But to your question of what's different about this time. I'd say two things. First, green hydrogen always required super low cost, zero carbon electricity. That was always the point. Up until a couple of years ago, we didn't have that. <laughs> so now suddenly we do. So one of the things we do is like the core feedstock, 50% of the cost or more is the cost of electricity. Suddenly the cost of zero carbon electricity is super cheap. That makes a whole bunch of things possible. The other thing that's happened, of course, is now we're getting the regulatory constraints along the lines that Eric talked about, and not just from a place like California, but every market in the world now. 90, 192 countries have signed the Paris Accord. 70% of the countries in the world have announced net zero targets, right? So the market is starting to appear for this stuff. And people are prepared to pay a little more for clean. That is not the case absent these kinds of pushes. That's why I work in a policy shop, because we're trying to internalize this externality and these policies are mattering. And in the case of green hydrogen, it's the things like the investment tax credit, the production tax credit, manufacturing tax credits, the carbon price in Europe, these things are making markets for green hydrogen in the same way that say the uh, Japanese uh, uh, it sort of purchasing power is making markets. And, and that's one of the things that's very distinct now. It begs the question though, of how big can it grow? Is this gonna end up being sort of a short-term niche that's profitable, but small, or will these trends continue to the point where hydrogen plays the big role we expect? I'd like to ask both of you to comment on the European Union hydrogen strategy. Um, which policies would you advise that they push forward? Um, and and what, how are you, what do you think about in terms of effectiveness? Eric? I was going to let Julio go first for that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, actually. Um, first of all, the, there's two things that I like immediately about the European policy framework. The first one is it's colorblind. They do not care if it's blue or green hydrogen. They care if it's low carbon hydrogen. And anything that's low carbon hydrogen qualifies. I think from a climate perspective, that's the best strategy. It's technology agnostic. It gives the market the most options. Um, and so far, so good on that. The other thing the, that the Europeans have committed to right off the bat is a whole bunch of infrastructure. <laughs> they are putting money to work in building transmission lines and refurbishing ports. 
and creating CO2 storage sites. Like that infrastructure piece, that's a good role for government. Those two things, you know, are, are definitely going to enable markets for real. And, and we have to see where, where that will all go. I expect we're also going to see additional policies emerge. The UK has a contract for difference policy, which they've been very clear about. That will help get stuff built. Uh, Germany is considering such a thing. They're considering modifying the energy vendor to provide more feed-in tariffs. Uh, we're starting to see industrial policy in Denmark and Norway. It's not the EU as a whole, but specific countries that are really relying on, on power to X or power to hydrogen as part of their industrial strategy. And those policies, as they come forward, create more market opportunities for companies like Air Products. And Eric, I th I think he nailed it. Uh, you know, we're um, uh, the technology agnostic. You know, uh, carbon intensity target is important to all of this. I think that's how most jurisdictions are arriving at uh, driving policy. And, uh, you know, to add beyond Europe, we're seeing uh, more policy around the globe associated with this. Uh, Canada, as an example, is about to release their clean fuel standard. Uh, they've already released a, a national hydrogen roadmap, same with the U.S. And so we're, we're just seeing a, a tremendous collective effort that's uh, all moving uh, broadly down the same path. We've got a really interesting question here from Ted Sheldon. In all cases for international exports such as Chile's, will the production from renewable electricity have to be above and beyond the ability of the country to reach its own domestic net zero carbon goals by 2050? Might a country forego its own decarbonization commitment in order to profit from exporting to others? Isn't that interesting? Uh, it's a fascinating question and uh, I think um, it, it's, you know, I, I would think that that would be difficult for a country to do, but certainly uh, a country such as Chile with the renewable resources they have, uh, you know, initially depending on how their policy takes shape and whether the uh, demand is, or arise, but, you know, I think the minister sounded like he was very committed to that, but certainly there are geographies that are probably a little bit further ahead in policy today, and uh, hopefully uh, Chile is able to catch up, but in the meantime, it's possible that they could become a green hydrogen production center uh, or an ex export market. I don't know if Julio, you'd like to add anything? Of course I would. <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's two different ways to think about this question. The first one is just the math. And basically, if you want to decarbonize your own economy 100% and export stuff, then yes, you need more than 100% of your electricity load. Like that's, that's just pretty, pretty simple. I think what the question is asking is a very different question, which is what's the right way to value the decarbonization service? And that is a much, much harder thing to answer. Um, I don't believe that countries are going to forego their own decarbonization as the way that the question was asked. I think that the Paris commitment uh, is a pretty strong driver in policy circles and people will wanna to cleave to that. But I think in, in terms of the staging, it is fair to ask what's the highest value to the country? Is the highest value to climate? Is the highest value to the economy? Is the highest value to the communities and the people? And you make somewhat different investment strategies depending on which of those policy outcomes you favor the most. Um, in the context of Chile, uh, the minister has been pretty clear about the fact that they're going for all of it. They're going for all of the above. They're gonna support their people. They're gonna decarbonize their own grid and sector. They're gonna meet their Paris commitments and they're gonna export stuff. That will require foreign direct investment. That will require an incredible build out and a bunch of money. And in the near term, they can just go after all of it because they need all of these things and there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, how to think through this value proposition is in fact something that we have talked about recently in a paper that we published at our center. And my co-author, Melissa Lott and I tried to frame this in the context of oversupply of electricity. I just posted the link to that report in the chat function for everybody with the idea that you can, you can, it's a good thought experiment. And this experiment has just been run in New Zealand. They, they, they shut down a load in their country and suddenly they have a whole bunch of hydropower that they didn't, don't know what to use before. And they're asking these questions. Is it better to build out grid and decarbonize the electric sector more quickly? Or is it better to build a product that they can export like hydrogen or ammonia? 
or is it more important to keep the local jobs? And, and those are hard questions for a policymaker to answer. Speaking of some of those related questions on the economic side, I'm gonna go ahead um, and, and walk through a couple more questions from the, the Q&A um, and ask both you, Julio and Eric to comment on them. Uh, one is, in addition, we've talked a lot about the, the cost of electricity and how the reduced cost of, of solar and wind uh, generation has enabled hydrogen to become more feasible. Um, what other, apart from, this is from Mauricio Cardenas, apart from the cost of electricity, can you talk about other costs? Yeah, that's certainly um, the capital costs associated with the project, uh, you know, the, our green hydrogen project in the Middle East, uh, it's going to take a tremendous amount of electrolyzer investment. Uh, bringing down the cost of that electrolyzer investment is um, you know, probably the second biggest uh, investment cost to uh, target. Um, you know, with that, we hope to gain efficiencies in the electrolyzer process. Uh, that will help the, you know, the efficiency of the units and further drive down costs. But yeah, certainly when we contemplate world scale projects like that, it's uh, around the capex and the cost of construction of those uh, facilities. Julio, would you like to comment? Nope, nothing to add to that. Okay. Following along those lines, this brings up an interesting question, and I'm, I'm going on to a question from Huho Liponen. Um, Chile is on its way to becoming a green hydrogen hotspot, and that's great. However, it seems that the gap between the cost of blue and green hydrogen continues to be enormous. So it should mean that companies with access to a natural gas stream and SMRs should be striking now to start manufacturing blue hydrogen on a large scale. But apart from a few projects that Julio showed, there's very little movement. Why do you think that is? I, I think that, uh, let me touch on that one and then Julio, I'll kick it off to you. But I think there are geographies that are looking at blue hydrogen projects. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a a map and I'll see if I can uh, find it, but it has the world on two sides. And one uh, shows all of the renewable power resources that we looked at today. The other shows all the fossil fuel um, resources on the right. And geographies that don't have great access to one or the other are stuck, but ones that have uh, uh, certainly the access to the renewable power can develop green hydrogen projects. The ones that have don't have access to renewable power but have great access to very low cost carbon feedstocks, when partnered with the geology supporting carbon capture, can develop nearly green hydrogen projects or nearly carbon free hydrogen projects if they sequester the CO2. Uh, one such geography is uh, Alberta, Canada. They have tremendously low carbon uh, natural gas, or excuse me, low cost natural gas. They also have uh, tremendous. Uh, geology supporting carbon capture and storage. They have a lot of infrastructure. So by using a process called auto thermal reforming, which is a different process to make hydrogen where you take oxygen and combine it with natural gas, you can get to 95% uh, or so carbon reduction, uh, maybe a little bit higher, depending if you uh, can find some attributes to attribute to the project, but you can get to almost zero carbon hydrogen. So absolutely every geography around the world seeing the transformation in the uh, energy sector is evaluating their natural resources, what's at their disposal and making a determination for how they remain relevant and can benefit their, um, their citizens and constituents uh, with uh, projects that will drive their economies. Right, um, first of all, uh, hi Yuho, nice to know that you're listening to us, I'm a fan. Um, we're already starting to see that to a certain extent. Uh, Eric mentioned Alberta and Canada as, as a place where they have both the fossil fuel and the green resources and are pursuing both strategies. Uh, the same things happened in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Eric mentioned the NEON project, but about the time that announcement came out, uh, the kingdom sent its first shipment of blue ammonia to Japan. They are definitely chasing a combined CCS uh, uh, fossil blue hydrogen strategy. Same thing with Australia. I mentioned that enormous green hydrogen project in Australia. There is also an enormous blue hydrogen project in Australia, <laughs> which is shipping liquid hydrogen to Japan from the Latrobe Valley. And, and uh, the same thing will happen in the US. We are going to see great renewable hydrogen projects in places like California and the Pacific Northwest. And we're going to see great blue hydrogen projects in places like the Gulf of Mexico. 
And uh, the last word on that is Europe has already kind of acknowledged that. Part of the reason why they're going with a colorblind strategy is in the near term, the blue hydrogen will be cheaper in most jurisdictions. But they also believe that the green hydrogen will eventually be cheaper. And by creating a market blind policy framework, I mean, a colorblind policy framework, that allows the market to develop organically and scale quickly. So I believe we're going to see a lot more blue hydrogen projects announced in the next year. We'll know whether I'm right or not shortly. <laughs> An interesting complimentary question from uh, RB. How will you monitor and enforce that sold hydrogen is green and not blue or gray? Well, I, let me take that one. First of all, I don't care if it's blue or green. I care if it's low carbon. The nuclear industry has started calling the, their hydrogen pink hydrogen. I personally think that's a mistake. I think they should go with <laughs> ultra green or something else like that. But chartreuse, they can choose their own color, but, but pink is a bit off brand. Um, but, but as long as it's low carbon hydrogen, I don't care. And I want to be clear about that. That should include the entire upstream emissions, right? So if there's upstream methane emissions from your blue hydrogen, that should hit your footprint. And maybe it's not so low carbon, right? Like we, we need to really be, be true about the accounting in these things. But uh, the good news about this is that the markets themselves are pretty sharp on this. And most regulators are pretty sharp about this too. In the case of the low carbon fuel standard in California, they have a very distinct protocol. You have to send in data every quarter, you know? And if you send in fraudulent data, you could be prosecuted by the state of California. Like there's pretty serious things. If you're claiming a tax credit in the United States, whether it's the renewable tax credit or the 45 QCCS tax credit, the IRS checks up on you. And if you fail, you're going to jail. And the same thing's true in the EU and the same thing's true for Japan. Like the markets actually watch pretty quickly and try to figure that out. There's not a lot of room for fraud in this market. Great. We have um, a number of questions. We're not gonna get to them all right now. We have more than a hundred. Um, I'm gonna ask a question to both of you from Philip Benoit. It seems like the challenge of getting hydrogen to customers, including at the retail level, uh, sounds formidable, maybe bigger than on the production side. What are your views about this aspect and what tangible actions are we seeing countries propose in that, that regard? Japan, Germany, he asks. I, uh, l let me, uh, I'll, I'll speak uh, to the, uh, the US case and uh, maybe Julio can round out the European uh, aspect of this, but certainly uh, moving, getting that hydrogen to market is uh, definitely, uh, you know, adds complexity to it, just like it does in today's transportation fuel market. Uh, we're essentially trying to replicate what we've been doing in uh, in the world for you know decades and decades, and uh, you know uh, jurisdictions like California that have supported the infrastructure build out, we're moving quickly towards that, and especially where the policy supports it, we can have the confidence to build out that infrastructure more quickly. Um, but um, that that can be a challenge. That's why I, th I think folks are contemplating pipelines as a means of moving hydrogen because lots of pipelines exist, and so. Uh, can we convert either idle or uh, existing natural gas pipelines to uh, pure hydrogen and then use that as the means for delivering hydrogen um, to, um, you know, uh, the transportation demand centers that that's uh, being looked at. There's all kinds of different ways we're uh, attacking this problem. You know, as I as part of our NEOM project, I mentioned we're, we've committed to $2 billion in downstream investment for that infrastructure. We realize that's a, a key component of all of this to get that hydrogen to the end user. And so that will require a significant amount of uh, infrastructure build out that you know companies like ours are committing to. Julio? Yeah, so two quick things, thoughts on that. One of them is for things like heavy duty vehicles like trucks and so forth, I don't imagine there's gonna be fueling stations everywhere or transportation infrastructure everywhere. It'll likely that that will be concentrated on corridors in the United States, say like I-5 on the West Coast or I-95 on the East Coast, where a fleet of vehicles will use the same stations over and over again, kind of the way that they use Phillips 66 stations today. Um, for applications like shipping or for transit uh, and for, for uh, you know maritime applications and so forth, uh, really the ports are where the action's happening. And again, the EU kind of started with that 
Japan is not only refurbishing its ports for ammonia and put, investing in ports like the one in Australia, they are also, of course, building ships. They have a proper industrial economy and shipbuilding, and so does Norway, and so does Singapore, and so do a few others. And so we're starting to see the maritime nations really limber up on this and put money not only into the port infrastructure, but into the ships themselves as an infrastructure issue. And the more of that that gets done, I think, like the minister said before, we're going to see these steps where suddenly a big chunk of the industry moves forward and then suddenly a big chunk of the industry moves forward. As that infrastructure build out happens, then you're going to see easier adoption. This yeah. is basically the hen house for the chicken and the egg problem. Yeah. And I was just going to build on that. Much of the operations that you're talking about are either return to base operations or point to point operations. And that is really the starting point. And then from there, you can expand to then cover uh, uh, the geographies in, in totality. But that you'll get a tremendous amount of the reduction just based on those uh, sectors. On the on the issue of, of let's let's talk a little bit about um, climate change. And, and we focus a lot on some of the, the, the technical issues and cost and market, but how do we accelerate um, achieving goals to reduce the impacts of, of climate change? Julio, can you speak to that? Sure, so let me first say from the policy perspective and then a quick technical thing, right? Because fundamentally, the way that we do this is with markets. Um, that, that we have to get these products to market and that requires a policy alignment. Uh, in the US, we tend to like incentives more than we tend to like regulations and other jurisdictions it's different, but we, we need to just basically do that. And as one example already, members of Congress, different committees and so forth are out there saying, we wanna provide a feed-in tariff or production tax credit or a contract for differences for low carbon hydrogen. And that will allow the rapid uptake because we cannot use this stuff until the molecules are out there. This is not like electricity. We need the molecules. We need to move them. People need to use them. And that requires a market to do it. It's kind of what Eric was talking about a moment ago. Like, we're, like we can't just auto replicate what we did with gasoline. Like it's a little different. We're trying our best, but we actually need to spend some money and do some stuff. And I think these market aligning policies are the fastest path. The second thing I would say about that is actually value the carbon piece. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily with a carbon price, but things like the low carbon fuel standard in California do it dollars per ton carbon. That's the footprint that they care about. If we change the renewable fuel standard in the United States to a low carbon fuel standard and valorize that thing, then we would actually have an opportunity to do that. And, and to, as a segue into the technical piece, Right now, a steam methane reformer emits 25 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of hydrogen it makes, okay? When you do CCS on that steam methane reformer, it releases about three, if you do like a lot of CCS, if you do, if you do the 95% capture case, right? Well, if you do green hydrogen, it emits almost none, right? Which is awesome. But if you did biohydrogen, it emits minus 20 kilograms. If you combine biohydrogen with CCS, you can have negative emissions hydrogen. If you just pay dollars per kilogram of hydrogen, you don't maximize that value. You gotta focus it on the carbon, make policies that are carbon oriented and whoever has the lowest carbon footprint for their hydrogen wins because they get paid the best. And I think that's really where we need to start putting our brains on this. How do we actually get the most value for the most abatement? Great. We have just a few more minutes and, and as a way to wrap up, I always like to ask panelists if they wanted to leave their audience with just a few thoughts, what would they be as, as a con some concluding comments, Eric? Um, well, we're, I'm certainly very encouraged by what's occurring uh, around the world today as evidenced by uh, you know, the level of interest here. Uh, I think there were almost uh, a thousand attendees. So it's clear that there are a lot of folks that are very focused on this. Uh, I think uh, with that, I want folks to know that uh, there are uh, companies like ours in the industry that are very focused on helping solve some of these big challenges in the market. We realize it takes a uh, kind of a consortium of folks to come together uh, to solve the, the production, the distribution, uh, the demand side with the vehicles and uh, have the appropriate regulatory framework to uh, 
support all of that investment. And so uh, that is occurring. You know, folks are trying to figure out how we get there as quickly as possible. There is not going to be a single answer for all of this. Uh, there will be a lot of different answers, uh, but hydrogen certainly is a, a big, bright, shining star to help us decarbonize, decarbonize quickly. All of the technologies that we're talking about are well-known, well-established, have been around for decades and can be uh, uh, built, owned, operated, maintained safely. So I'm very excited about it, and thank you for participating. Thank you, Eric. Julio, would you like to make some closing comments? I would indeed. I'm going to make just one, actually. Uh, among all the things that I have talked about so far and that I love talking about, I haven't talked about finance. And I haven't talked about the fact that there's a lot of companies that want to put money to work in this space. I'm getting calls from banks, from equity houses, from all these people. They want to know about hydrogen because they see the opportunity. They smell that this is like solar was 15 years ago and they want to get into it, right? And they, everybody believes they can make some money. And I think that's true. And this gets back to the idea that I said before, there's room to work for everybody here. If you're a business person, if you're an investor, if you're a financier, man, there are opportunities in this space for real. And Eric and I have only scratched the surface on where this can go and what it can do. Also, I would encourage the people to think broadly about the market applications. Everyone so far has talked about power or talked about boats and trucks. Like, okay, fine. Those are good things to do. But decarbonizing steel is really, really hard. We need hydrogen to do it in existing plants and replacement plants, decarbonizing chemical production, decarbonizing fertilizer production. It's hard to do. And it's as big, if not bigger, than the transportation sector. All the cars and the planes in the world emit less than just melt, burning rocks to melt rocks in the industrial sector. Like we need heat and hydrogen can go into those markets if we have the molecules. So there's a market expansion opportunity here that's very real. Synthetic fuels look the same way. Like two years ago, synthetic fuels weren't a thing. Now they really are. Heathrow Airport wants to buy them. Port Authority in New York wants to buy them. Nobody's making them. So we got to get on with the business. And that means hydrogen. That means direct air captured CO2. That means standards in the markets, all this stuff. But the thing that I'm excited about is how much money there seems to be willing to explore this space. Because ultimately, that's what it's going to take. As the minister said, it's going to take trillions of dollars to do this for the whole globe. And thankfully, we have trillions of dollars. I'm feeling like we need another webinar to talk about that particular piece, both the finance piece and applications, because we didn't have enough time to go into it. So perhaps we should be talking about doing another one of these. Um, thank you again uh, to our panelists for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. As I mentioned, the full recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. For a full calendar of our upcoming events, please visit us online. Um, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day from the Center on Global Energy Policy at Purdue University School of International Public Affairs.